So we'd like to start by introducing yourself and um, an overview of your career and like growing up and what that was like for you. So uh, my name is Megumi Kanda and I have been playing uh, principal trombone with the Milwaukee Symphony for um, gosh, since 2002. So whatever year that is, um, 18, 19 years. Um, so anyway, um, you know, I grew up, um, I, I have an American mom and a Japanese dad and I was born in Japan. And, um, let's see, growing up, the first instrument I played was the piano. And, um, you know, you, you would think I was pretty good at it, but I was really bad at it. I mean, I hated it. And I used to practice like three minutes a week. And, uh, you know, every time my teacher comes to our home, I would just like run away. Like, you know, I would just lock myself into the closet so she can't find me. And I was such an annoying student. Like I grew my nails all week just to annoy my teacher. Um, so... Anyway, my teacher told me that, she, you know, that I was like the worst student she's ever seen and she saw uh, no musical talent whatsoever in me. So, so that was my um, uh, beginning of uh, the music uh, journey here. Um, and uh, when I was 10, I started playing the trombone. Now, um, I, I only joined the band because um, my best friend was a clarinet player. You know, she started playing the clarinet in the van. So I was like, okay, I wanna play the clarinet too with my friend. Um, so I joined the band, but then, you know, clarinet is popular. So, you know, by the time I joined, um, there was no clarinets available. So, so my teacher was like, okay, why don't you go in the storage room and see what's left over? So then the only thing that was left over was the trombone. So, um, so there was really no choice for me. It was like either play that or not join the band. So, you know, I picked up the trombone and then I played a note on it and I'm like, wait, this is so cool. Like I never knew there was an instrument like this and this is like sounding so good. So, so it was kind of, um, you know, kind of a love at first sight. I just loved it from the beginning. Um, but you know, it didn't, it didn't go well. Uh, at the beginning because you know usually like the upperclassmen would teach the younger kids um, but the trombone was so unpopular there was no upperclassmen <laughs> so, so there, there was nobody teaching me trombone so, so what I did was I put the trombone together um, but I put it together backwards so, so usually you use your right hand to move the slide, but I, I was moving the left hand, um, you know, and um, I had no idea there were positions. So the way I was figuring out no, notes were like, I would play a note on the piano, like play a C, and then I'm like, okay, it's around here, and then D is around here. So, so everything was just a guessing game for me. Um, so, um, you know, like a month into, you know, a month after we started playing these instruments, there was this test called Mary Had a Little Lamb Test. Um, and all the newbies, we got to play Mary Had a Little Lamb. And then if you do a good job, you get a sticker. So um, everybody passed except for me. I was the only one that didn't pass in the whole band. And I'm like oh great, like, you know, I'm like the worst pianist and I'm like the worst trombonist in the band. So, um, you know, but, but I really liked the trombone, so I wanted to figure out why I, I was so bad. So um, I went to a music store and got, got a book on trombone. And then I figured out, it's like, wait, my trombone's backwards. <laughs> So, so then, I, and then I flipped it over and it's like, wait, this is like a lot easier to move with the right hand. And then I kept reading and it's like, wait, there are seven positions in the trombone, you know? So, so I had no idea the, uh, you know, about these things. So um, yeah, that, that was like an aha moment. It's like maybe I can be decent if I worked really hard at it, even though I'm like the worst player in the band. Um, so, you know, as a young kid, I, I did practice quite a lot just to catch up with the rest of the band because I always felt like I was really bad at like any kind of music. Um, and I guess um, one of the things I did early on 
is uh, my mom. She, uh, she, you know, she's a pianist, a church pianist, and uh, she she had a lot of influence on me. You know, she she always told me um, that trombone is one of the most beautiful instruments ever, and um, you know that we need to play like melted butter. You know, and uh, we started playing at church. Um, you know, when I was ten years old, and we pretty much played every week. And, and that's kind of been like a big influence as I grew up. It's like, you know, trombone's got the most beautiful sound. I'm always gonna, you know, really sing like it's a hymn. So I guess that's kind of like my, you know, youngster days. Yeah. But it seems like you did, you got better really quick because at 15, you were one of the top, or named top 10 um, Japanese wind and percussion competition. Yeah, I guess I did practice quite a lot. And, and it was it was just because, you know, I, I knew I was like the worst thing that ever happened to trombone, you know? So, so I did practice quite a lot. But then, you know, being being named as like, you know, the top 10 when I was like 15 and then being a national champion at 17, that that was actually not that good for me. You know, mo mostly it was kind of a negative thing for me. You know, for me, I was really surprised, you know, as I told you, you know, I always thought I was like the worst musician ever, um, even though I loved it. Um, and then, you know, as soon as I, you know, started like, getting better and winning stuff um you know i, I felt like you know I, I, be, I became like kind of a star figure like a star figure like oh she's gonna be like the next big star and, and that was that really weighed heavy on me i mean you know so, so i always felt like i had to be perfect and um it really had negative effects on me i mean like how negative was it like um, you know, every time I performed, I used to spike up a fever. Yeah. And every morning when I had like a performance, I would wake up and I would have like cold sores on my lip only when I perform. It never happens otherwise, you know. And then every performance, um, you know, I had a garbage can backstage because I knew I was going to throw up. <laughs> and it happened like it was like every time for years actually yeah so so it was it was for me it was gosh my teenagers were really tough and some people told me you know maybe you shouldn't be a musician because you're not you know mentally really strong enough to do this um but then then i read something really cool um i i read that luciano Pavarotti, the you know the great tenor singer he used to throw up and i'm like wait awesome <laughs> you know? it's like okay awesome he is doing great so so i thought okay maybe there is a way for me to get over this someday too so and 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 quitting was never an option for me i just loved it so much that you know even if i had a fever non-stop um you know i was gonna go for it yeah wow that's really interesting Interesting. I think a lot of people can relate to performance anxiety, but it's just so interesting that um, you're experiencing such severe things so young and you kept going. And, and also, usually you'd think it would be the opposite, like when you're not great at something and everyone kind of sees you as the one who's not great. Yeah. it's easy to be then be like, OK, I'm out of this, like I can't do this. But yeah. that was when you pushed yourself the most. Which is, is a lot, it says a lot about your character, I think. So then you went to the U.S. and studied at CIM, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. What was that transition in your life like? Well, um, you know, I, I always knew that I wanted to um, leave Japan. And I, I knew that I probably wanted to come to the U.S. But, you know, I wasn't really sure. Should I go to Europe? Should I go to U.S.? Um, so, um, you know, I went to this seminar um uh like a brass seminar and uh, met this trumpet player um he was the principal trumpet player of the met uh mark gould and uh you know he heard me play and um i you know i talked to him I'm, I'm like well you know what do you think about me going to the u.s and studying and he's like yeah let me let me think about that and uh you know and that was that so then 
a few weeks later, I get a fax. You know, like a paper that comes out of the machine. Yeah, <laughs> I, I get a fax um, from from the U.S. and uh, it was from Jim Desano, um, the the principal trombone player of the Cleveland Orchestra. And uh, he said, "Hey, we're gonna be in Japan、uh, in a few weeks. Why don't you come play for me?" I'm like, "Okay, cool." So then,、um, you know, I go meet him,、um, you know, at the hall. And I thought it was kind of weird, you know. I, I played for him, and there was a trumpet player too. The principal trumpet player was listening to me too, and and I finished playing, and you know they're like, "Okay, see you in September." And I'm like, "Wait, what?" But but I was like, "Okay." And then, and so I had no idea what in the world was going on.、Um, so. A few, like you know, a few weeks later, I get a letter from、uh, CIM, the Cleveland Institute of Music, and it says, "Congratulations and welcome to Cleveland Institute of Music." And I'm like, "Wait, was that an audition? Like, I thought it was a lesson." <laughs> you know, so, so I took an audition without knowing it was an audition. And I, you know, honestly, I've never heard of Cleveland. I mean, I was just, you know, a high school kid that's totally clueless. So I thought it was Greenland,、um, you know. And I'm like, gosh, am I going to like Greenland?、Uh, <laughs> But then, you know, when I looked at the map, it's like, wait, there's Greenland and there's Cleveland. Cleveland is in the U.S. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> so, so that's kind of,、um, you know, how I ended up at Cleveland. Um, and、uh, you know, yeah, adjustment is hard. You know, e- even though my mom always spoke to me in English, I always spoke back in Japanese. So I knew how I wanted to sound, but I couldn't sound the way I wanted to sound. You know, and, and I, you know, I didn't understand the sense of humor. You know, it's like when people were joking, I thought they were serious.、Um, So yeah, I was like pretty quiet for like two years, and even now I see、um, you know people who went to CIM and they're like, "Hi Megumi," and I'm like, "Who are you?" You know, I I, I was I, you know I I think I was totally like just like just just trying to survive, and so I you know for the first two years I I have no idea what was going on, <laughs> but but about the third year I became like who I am, you know, kind of like okay I'm. Back to normal. I'm adjusted. So yeah, that was kind of the transition、um, coming to the U.S.、So、we, we also wanted to hear about.、Um, we read that you had been injured and how you got through that. If you want to just talk a little bit about that.、Um, so you know the, the injury.、Um, you know injury doesn't happen overnight. You know I, I was always kind of an obsessive practicer. You know. Um, I mean, even even as a grade school student, I was practicing a couple of hours just just because I liked it, you know. And 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 in high school, I was you know I was starting to get injured already, I think. But then you know just the finishing touches came when I、uh, went to CIM, and you know I'm studying with、uh, Jim Desano, who is just like you know really fabulous, and I'm just learning so many fun. Things you know, new and fun things、um, that I just was practicing crazy hours.、Um, so then、um, I finally came to a point that I can't even hold a single note, you know. And I would touch my face, and it's like even just touching my face was painful, you know. So it's like, wow, great! That that was my first year at CIM, you know. So so yeah, c- combine this with like you know being lost with language. And everything too, so very very rough year.、Um, so anyway,、um, you know, we we went to the you know I went to the doctor、um, because I wasn't sure what was going on. I mean, I couldn't hold a note.、Um, so there was a specialist in Cleveland. He you know specializes in musicians, and he said, okay, take six weeks off, and that is as much as you're gonna heal. And after six weeks. Um, you have to make a decision. You know, if it doesn't work,、um, you can give up there, or you can find a different way of playing. 
but you have to like leave your past behind. You know, it's it's like pe people don't talk about it, but once you get injured, it's like playing playing can become like a really scary thing. You know, so um, so that's why you have to like leave your past behind because if you keep thinking about you got injured, you can't recover from it. You know, so um. So I took six weeks off, locked the trombone in the locker and hid the key, you know, <laughs> so I can't even touch it. Um, so then after six weeks, um, you know, I came back, I picked up the trombone. I still can't hold a note. And it's like, oh, great. Like, you know, and in the meantime, I'm thinking, okay, what, what, what else can I do? Like, what kind of other careers can I have? And, you know, I thought about being a doctor. It's like, yeah, kind of cool, but it's just not me. You know, I just got to figure out how to make this work, you know, because it's like I just want to play. So, um, so then I had a brilliant teacher and he had a lot of trouble himself. Like, you know, he, he had this nasty thing called brass poisoning. Um, so what, what happened was like, you know, he, he over practiced, but he was an obsessive practicer too. He over practiced, cut his lip, and then the poison from the brass went in there and got this massive infection on his lip and he had to recover from that. So, so it was like, you know, kind of different, but he's been through something that was sort of similar. So, um, so he was like, you know, just, just just for the sake of trying, can you free buzz? And I'm like, sure, let's give it a try. So then I go like, you know, and it's like, wait, I can free buzz. I didn't, you know, I didn't think about that. Okay. So then he was like, okay, so what if you kept the same airspeed and the same embouchure? Can you uh, buzz the mouthpiece? And I, you know, I kept the same airspeed and the same embouchure. And what do you know? I can play, you know, I, I can buzz on the mouthpiece. And then keeping the same airspeed and the same, you know, um, embouchure, I was able to play a note on the trombone. So, so, you know, the difference here is I used to rely on the lip, you know, but now I'm relying on the air. And then, you know, when you free buzz, actually, it makes you don't rely on your lips, but it's actually like you rely on this, uh, you know, the big muscle that, you know, surrounds the lip. So you don't really need a lip anymore, you know? So, so that's how, um, you know, I got to play again. And the rebuilding process was really slow. Um, I could only play a note if I were doing everything absolutely right. As soon as my air slowed down, or as soon as I relied on the lip, sound would stop, you know? So it started three minutes at a time, you know, three minutes, three times a day is what I did. Three minutes in the morning, three minutes in the afternoon, three minutes in the evening. But in that three minutes, I was gonna absolutely focus on what I need to be doing and do everything right. And, um, you know, that, that was like six months of three minute practices. Um, and then it was like, I was able to expand it to like 15 minutes each time. And then after that was really fast. Yeah, actually at the end of, um, I, I set a really big goal for myself at the end of this, I, uh, set a goal that I wanted to go to an international competition in six months when I started practicing three minutes at a time. Yeah. So, so I was like, that's kind of sick. Um, but, but I, I needed something to work towards. Um, so, um, yeah, like, you know, two weeks before the competition, I was able to do, you know, 15, 15, 15. And then the week before the competition, I was able to play nine concertos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and, and you know the conter I mean the you know the competition it was you know I, I was missing too many notes you know I mean I was I was just not strong enough but but it was like a personal victory for me I set that goal because you know the doctor said it's like you get scared of playing in front of people 
and I did not want to be scared. So I, that, that's why I picked an international competition. I wanted to play in front of the world to introduce the new me, you know? And, uh, and it, was, it was a personal victory. There were some, um, you know, folks from Japan that was there too, and they were like, we're really disappointed in you. And I was like, okay, good. This is, my, this is the new me, thank you. <laughs> You know, um, uh, but then there was, uh, there was one person, um, one of the judges, he was um, uh, the, the principal trombone player of the Boston Symphony, and he probably doesn't uh, remember this. Uh, his name is um, Ron Barron, and uh, he said, you know, you really were not very strong, but your music was the most powerful, mm. you know, and, and it's like, I was like, yes, I can make a difference again. You know, so that was kind of my recovery process. Um, but but for me, um, it's like, you know, like the first B flat major scale that I could play after the injury. It was like, wow, this is so cool. You know, so, so um, you know, I don't, I don't take notes for granted. You know, every, everything is a gift. Everything you can play is a gift. And, and this is kind of what changed my outlook. You know, I, I don't have to be perfect. It's like, I'm just glad to be able to play anything. And then that's when the nerves went away. Yeah. yeah and this is also like kind of the second time you were going through this, like as a child, yeah. you know, you were like, you know, felt like the worst one. And then you turned your trombone around and you're like, <laughs> oh, that's all I needed to do. And now here you're like, oh, the airspeed, that's yeah. all I needed to do. And you, yeah. you, did you feel like you were like reliving that childhood experience at all? You know, I, ne I never thought about that. That's a really good point. <laughs> that, that is a really good point. Uh, I, I do think that this injury um, was like the best thing that happened to me in, in the hindsight. You know, up, up to that point, even though I was kind of the worst and all, you know, I felt like I was the worst. But, I, I, you know, I think I was just a talented kid. You know, I, I didn't have to think about anything. You know, I was able to play anything that I was supposed to play and then you know you're freshman in college and I had to relearn everything and I'm in a conservatory and I just learned how to play a b-flat major one octave scale you know so so you know yeah it, it, it was it was the best thing that happened to me because I had to think like how does it work like what do I need to be doing for this to work and, you know, that made me into a much better teacher because if you ask me, like, how do you do that? I'm like, yeah, I can tell you about it because, you know, I had to think about this all. And, and you know, so, yeah, when I came back, I'm, I'm like a better version of what I used to be. Can I also ask um, yeah. how, when you were doing those, um, like, yeah. three-minute and then 15 minute practice sessions were you doing some anything else like outside of playing obviously because you had you yeah. couldn't play as much yeah. um, was it to prepare for that competition yeah yeah um so I guess I did a few things you know I, I'm really into mental practice you know there, there's there's even a, um, one episode uh, when I was in high school you know I said I, I was starting to get like injured right so um there was an episode at the end of high school where, um, you know, I was chosen to play in this like big recital where, you know, there was going to be like 2000 people that was coming. And um, the, the trouble was, um, I was at the very beginning of an injury. So I knew if I took like, you know, three weeks off, I could play this concert. But I needed three weeks off in order to play it. But you know, sometimes high school kids are really dumb. So then I picked a new piece. <laughs> It's like, I'm going to play something new. Um, so, so I knew that I needed three weeks off, and I was never going to be able to play this piece before the concert. So um, I decided to learn it mentally. So, you know, I just, uh, you know, practiced the piece on the piano, you know, I tried to memorize all the uh, notes, and then I would sing it and then move my slide, pretending like I'm playing it. And, you know, I would just like draw like a graph of like, you know, like this is where this, you know, phrase is going to go. And, and then I even put a story on the, uh, you know, on the song. And then I practiced a lot, like, you know, like 
how do I want to feel walking out on the stage? And what do I want people to like feel when they hear me? And I just ran that image like in my head many, many times. Uh, and even the rehearsal with the pianist, all I did was sing. Um, so the first time I've ever played this piece was on the concert. And <laughs> so, yeah, it's like, it's nuts. But, but, you know, it felt so familiar because I lived it in my head so many times, you know. So, so preparing for this competition, so much was like that, you know. I'm just like living it in my head, you know. I can't do it physically yet, but I will get there because I've done it in my head, you know. So, yeah. yeah, that's something I did when I was preparing for the competition. And then the other thing is you really need, like, a different outlet. You know, like, tr trombone makes me happy, you know. P playing it is, you know, it keeps me sane. Um, so if you, ca if you can only play, like, three minutes, you need a different outlet, you know. So, so I did a lot of um, painting. You know, I, I love gardening so then I went to like different gardens to like enjoy the garden you know you just need some kind of an outlet you know to, to, to keep you like sane yeah and then I, I do love music so you know I uh, went to a lot of the Cleveland Orchestra you know concerts that make me happy you know <laughs> so so you just you know you just have to like find different outlets yeah, basically all of the people we interview to um, always have some kind of outlet and it usually it's a creative one, like whether it's poetry or like you were saying art. Mm -hmm. It's kind of interesting how musicians kind of pick up these other creative outlets like gardening can be super creative too. Oh, totally. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You were saying how you wanted people to feel something when you were playing. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of us as musicians really want that. That's our goal. But specifically talking to other trombone players, this is what they they say about you is like her artistry, her she sings everything. And so and, and I know in the beginning of the interview, you were talking about like playing at church. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, if you could just talk about that, I think that would be really great. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it, it all kind of stems from when I was a kid, you know, playing at the church. And, you know, when you play at church, you're playing hymns, you know. Um, so so you always think of like, you know, being a singer. You know, I, I always said, you know, I just happen to be a trombone player, but I'm just like singing through my trombone. And another thing, I guess, um, is, you know, when you play hymns, you're trying to express words, you know. And a lot of times um, I was trying to do like, okay, so how do I express this word or this emotion through the hymn because I don't have a word, you know, playing the trombone, I cannot use words, but how can I turn the notes into words? You know, that, that was something that I always um, worked on since I was, you know, a little kid. Yeah, and, and even now, I think it's that's the most important thing. I always tell my students, you know, it's like you got to have something you want to say through your trombone, you know, because if you don't have any message, then your music is nothing, you know, it's meaningless. You know, we just speak through our trombone. But yeah, and it's, it's almost like in a way your injury kind of led you to that because you yeah. had to sing. You know, you had to find your voice because yeah. you couldn't just, you know, hide behind a trombone. A lot happened in this life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also curious, I guess, yeah. we can kind of go into your teaching philosophy since that's yeah, yeah. what we're reading. Could you speak more to how you develop that artistry in people? And like, I know for me personally, one thing that's always hard is like getting past being worried about the notes and mm -hmm. actually making the music. That's like something that takes a lot of effort for me. You know, I, I think the number one thing that I tell the students, it's like, you know, I just, I, I like to teach the students the joy of music, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, if you're not in love with music and you're not happy to play, then it's going to show, you know, you, you got to be super excited to play. You got to, you, you know, you got to love what you're doing. So, so, you know, I always tell the students, it's like, don't worry about the little things. It's the big picture. You know, it's like, bring your joy out through your trombone and people will hear it, you know? So, so for me, it's always, yeah, I'm telling the students, it's like, have a message, 
you know, have a message, express big, you know, I, I give them the tools, you know, I'll give them the tools, but then I don't want them to be like, um, like a copycat of me. You know, I, I, I always, you know, give them the tools. I'm like, take this and turn it into your own music. You know, um, I, and, and, you know, I think a lot of times students don't realize how awesome they can sound. You know, I, I, I feel like I, I always hear what the student is able to do, but he doesn't, or he or she doesn't know what they're able to do. So, so I love showing them like, you know, if you do the everything right, you're going to be able to do this, you know? And I think that's really, really fun to show them like what their true potential is. Um, and, uh, you know, I, um, you know, I always tell them to enjoy the journey, you know, the, the journey of like trying to become the best version of you never ends, you know, and, and that's, you know, that's something I work on every day too. It's like, it, I'm not done, you know, I haven't reached my best version and, uh, you know, I keep asking myself every day, it's like, okay, what could I have done better? Or like, why did that work? You know, and, and I want my students to do that too. And I always tell them to become your own teacher. You know, always, you know, observe yourself, keep asking yourselves questions. So like you keep getting better and better all life long. And that's something that, you know, they should enjoy. So yeah, and ha having gone through all this, like, you know, injury and s seeing, you know, like seeing a lot of things, like, you know, being the young top student to the rock bottom that everybody's like disappointed in. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of like I, I'm here, uh, uh, to encourage my students and it's, it's like my mission, you know, to, to, you know, to encourage and help the students along to see like the bigger picture and, you know, being, you know, just very joyful about playing, you know, little things doesn't matter. It's, it's what you say through your instrument that really matters. Is there anything specifically that you do with your students to help them develop their artistry? Because some of us haven't come from backgrounds where we necessarily sing a lot in class or we're playing at church, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, yeah, I'm a horrible singer too. It's like, it's, <laughs> it's, it's really sad. The, the way I sing is horrible. So, so I always say, because I can't sing, I sing through the trombone. Um, I, I always, um, make them tell me stories, you know, it's like, you know, if they're, if they're playing and I'm not getting anything, I'm like, I have no idea what you're trying to tell me. You know, what, what are you trying to tell me here? Like, do you have a story? Do you have an image or what are you trying to tell me? You know, and, and that's, that's a tough question for a lot of students you know they're trying to play the notes and it's like they're not trying to tell me a story so yeah they, they hate me for that um <laughs> but but i like to put them on the spot and and make them share what they're thinking and then you know if i hear it then they've done a good job and if i don't hear it i'm like you gotta you gotta tell me more you know you gotta like you know it's not coming through you know, so, so yeah, I like to, I want my students to be really dynamic with their, you know, expression and I'll, I'll keep asking until I get their message. <laughs> Was teaching something you always wanted to do or how did you end up like having this love for it? Well, you know, um, it's kind of a mixed thing. Okay. So I, so I have the, like this role model, um, uh, my sixth grade band director, she was just awesome. She was just like so awesome. She she took, you know, she took me totally seriously. I mean, she used to write me letters all the time, and you know, she just totally showed me the love of music. And so she has been like my role model. We still stay in touch, you know. After like, I mean, what, thirty plus years, you know, <laughs> so, so that, that's how influential she was. Um, so, so that made me feel like, okay, I want to like, you know, do the same as she did to me. Um, but I, I think I was really scared to teach. I was intimidated, 
you know, um, I, I had my first student when I was in high school and I was like, I have no idea what to tell you, you know, um, just do it. I'll show you, you do it, you know? So, so it was, it was pretty rough going at the beginning. And I started teaching again, um, after college, you know, um, I, I didn't really want to teach, um, you know, I kind of started teaching because, you know, I mean, you know, you graduate from music school, you need the money, you know, but, but honestly, I was really intimidated to teach because, um, you know, I, I didn't grow up in the U.S. I always thought like American high school kids are like so mature looking and I may not be able to like connect to them, you know, so, so I was really scared to teach. But then once I started teaching, I'm like, okay, these are like super cute kids, you know, <laughs> it's like I, we were able to make like connections right away. And then because of, you know, like what I have gone through during college, I was like really able to help them. Um, and then now I love teaching, you know, but, but it was, I, I was not like, you know, I want to teach. I, I was really scared of teaching. It's cool to hear how that like organically evolved for you. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, and now, now I think teaching is like part of my mission. Mm. You know, it's like it's my responsibility to like pass on what I know, you know. But yeah, but it was not always natural and I yeah. was scared. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and you're not only passing along knowledge, you're also passing along that joy that you have, mm. which I think is infectious, you know. Actually, I'm, I'm also really curious to yeah. kind of shift now into more yeah. the um, Milwaukee side of your career and also, yeah, yeah. you know, what that was like. And then also, I know you have two sons, right? Uh, three sons. Oh, three sons. So yeah. what it was like, like having a family going, you know, during all of that and how you navigated all of, yeah, family life and career. Gosh, family life. Yeah, yeah. You got, you got to be good at like multitasking. Um, yeah, I, I remember... Um, you know, uh, the first concert I came back from um, the maternity break um, after I had my first son, um, we played Sanson's Symphony Number no. Three, which is like, you know, kind of a you know trombone excerpt. And you know, my first son, gosh, he did not sleep. I mean, he he woke up like every hour for a whole year. I mean, he was a he was a one of a kind. So um, this first concert back from maternity break, I fell asleep in the middle of the concert. <laughs> and I just woke up like three seconds before my entrance and I was like, oh my gosh, it's my solo. <laughs> you know? so, so it just it just like keeps everything in a really healthy perspective. You know, I, when I was younger, when I was like, you know, in, in Rochester, say, you know, that, that was the job before I got into Milwaukee. Um, you know, if I missed a note, I was upset for the whole weekend, you know. And, uh, you know, after having a family, it's kind of like you miss a note, you come home, and then you have a bunch of kids. Like, you know, uh, you know they, they have their thing. It's like, yeah, look at my animal. Or like, you know, you, you got to, you know, you got more important things to focus on. So, um, yeah, family life has really made me a better, you know, well-rounded person. Um, you do want to have a really good husband, though. Um, you you want to have somebody that really understands what's important for you. Um, my husband, uh, he plays the French horn and the Milwaukee Symphony, too. So, you know, when the kids were really little, um, you know, not, now they're like, the oldest one is like high school. The youngest one is third grade, you know, so, so they're quite a bit older. But when they were little, it was really difficult to find practice time. And it was really, uh, you know, nice to have a husband, you know, that understood that uh, my happy place was practice time, you know. So then we would just take turns practicing. So, yeah, you, you do want to have a, a spouse that's really um, understanding to your need. Um, yeah, but, yeah. But, but you know, if you, if you ever feel like, you know, oh, gosh, I don't know if I can handle that, it's amazing. 
um, especially women, we're so good at multitasking. You know, it's like, it's amazing how many things you can do at the same time. Um, you know, I, I was laughing at myself once because I was, you know, I, I've written two books. And uh, the first book, when I was writing the first book, I had, I was holding one son on the, on one side and I was cooking and then typing while I was doing that, <laughs> you know? And, uh, you know, and I was just like laughing at myself. It's like, wow, this is like, I bet nobody has any idea. I'm cooking and I have a baby and I'm writing a book. <laughs> yeah. And it's important that we do hear this because I think a lot of the times, you know, younger women in the field feel like they have to make this choice and they don't. Yeah, exactly. That, that's kind of what I thought too. You know, when I was growing up, I didn't think I would ever get married. You know, I, I thought I was going to be like this person that's dedicated to music and that was going to be my life. There's so much more to it, though, you know, and, and you don't have to choose. You know, it's you can have three kids, a great husband and then a musical career. And you even have time to write a book. You know? <laughs> yes, that's definitely something I would like to aspire to. <laughs> Um, I'm curious to hear about your audition process and like how it was taking auditions and your successes and failures and how that kind of helped you get to where you are. Sure, sure, sure. Um, so auditions. Um, okay. So the first audition that I won, um, I had no business winning that one. It was a miracle. Um, I, uh, I won um, the Albany Symphony principal position after the third year in college. Now, I, I really did not have any business winning it. I don't know how it happened. Um, so then after that, it was, um, it was really hard. I, uh, for three years, I took many, many auditions, and it didn't really go well. Um, I think the big turning point, I mean, you know, each lesson you learn something, you know, new and, you know, you learn about yourself. Um, and uh, the, the turning point for me uh, came when there was um, the second trombone opening in the Cleveland Orchestra. You know, it's, it was going to be like, gosh, I want to play next to my teacher. Wouldn't that be a dream job? You know, so I really wanted that job. So. Um, I, you know, turned in the resume, but Cleveland Orchestra is a very picky orchestra. You know, they, they don't let any, you know, they, they only invite like a dozen people to come to auditions. So, uh, my resume was not strong enough with the regional orchestra. So they said, um, no, you're not welcome to come, but you are welcome to make a tape. And I was like, yes, great. So, um, so then I decided I'm going to make a tape that, is absolutely perfect that nobody can ever pick on so so I made that into my like project and I dedicated like a whole like you know whatever time I had it was like three weeks or a month or whatever I dedicated that whole time to make a perfect recording um, and in, in the meantime while I was trying to make this perfect recording this is weird but I split into two people you know, it was like, you know, so sometimes when you play, you get so caught up in what you're doing, you can't listen to yourself, you know, and then by making, you know, I, I recorded myself, I listened to it, and then, you know, I, I hear it, and, and then I tried to fix it, and then I started splitting into two people, it's like, I'm playing, but I can still observe myself, like, really calmly, you know, um, and, so I was not as caught up in what I was doing, you know, um, it was a really weird sensation, but, but it's like, yeah, so I split. Um, yeah. Uh, so that was kind of a turning point for me. And, um, that was the first time that I made it into the finals. And then I was a runner up for that audition too. It was the first time I played in a sectional and I think that's where I failed. Um, <laughs> But, but that, that was really the turning point. Um, so, uh, about a month later, there was another audition, uh, principal trombone in Montreal. And, and that's the one that I was like, okay, I'm going to win this thing. I'm so going to win this. So then I go to Montreal, um, and, 
uh, in the finals. I'm playing William Pell, you know, it has a fast trombone part, and then I let go of my slide, um, and then it flies across the stage, and, uh, you know, it was, it was kind of an unpleasant audition anyway. They were kind of mean to the Americans. Uh, I didn't speak French, and they were kind of like, mm, kind of like snooty to the English speaking people, I think. And then at the end, you know, I let go of the slide and they laugh at me and that was it, you know? So I was like so mad. Um, so that was like 11 p.m. and I, I call my roommate and I'm like, I hate this town. Like this audition was total garbage. And you know, I'm like just, you know, complaining to her. And then my roommate tells me, hey, uh, did you know that I signed up is I sign you up for an audition tomorrow morning. I'm like, what, what is this? Like, I don't know of any auditions. And she said, you know, you were in Japan and uh, the international musician said there was like a second trombone opening in Rochester. And because I knew you would not see it, I forged, forged a check for you and sent in your resume. And I think it's tomorrow at nine, let me check. And she's like, oh yeah, it's nine o'clock tomorrow morning. I'm like, okay, 9 a.m. tomorrow, I, I can make it on time if I leave right now. So, so I left Montreal at 11 p.m., made it to Rochester by like 8.30. I took a few naps on the side of the uh, highway, um, and I showed up to Rochester at 9 a.m., and I had no idea what was on the list. Um, you know, I, I, this audition was not on my radar. So, um, you know, I just show up and I see a couple of pieces I've never played, but I'm like, whatever, I'm just going to do it. Um, and then a couple of pieces that I didn't know was asked, asked on the audition, but in the warm up room, I saw a nice looking guy and I'm like, hey, what's your interpretation on this piece? And he's like, oh, this is how I like to do it. And I'm like, that's really cool. Thank you. You sound great. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, I, I got that piece down. Okay. So, <laughs> so, so um, you know, I, uh, I won that audition. <laughs> and I never knew what was on the list even. I, I didn't even, I, I didn't even have a mute. There was like one piece that needed a mute. <laughs> It was, it was totally, um, yeah. So anyway, yeah, you ne you never know about <laughs> which auditions you're going to win. <laughs> I think if I learn anything from you in this hour, it's how to be fearless. You are just fearless. You will go for anything like, and, and you've yeah. learned so much from it. I, I yeah. feel like there's been moments where, yeah, we just need to be more fearless. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, in the, in the finals, in, in Rochester, you know, one of the things that the conductor liked to do is like to change his tempo. And um, yeah, and then um, he asked me to play Scheherazade last movement, the fourth movement that has a lot of triple tongue. And that's one of the pieces I've never played. And I'm like, oh, great. I've never played this piece. This is like triple tongue and the conductor's like changing tempo. Wow. But then, then but then, you know, it's like, I've, I've had a couple of experiences like where I almost died and then you know when when you're really like focused everything goes slow motion so I'm like okay get in that slow-mo mode and I'm gonna like read this thing down read you know sight read this and then follow the conductor and it's like yeah it's amazing what you can do when you're really focused and I guess that's one of the things that I um I learned through throughout this audition pro you know, process, you know, I always felt like I could only do like half as good as I could do. Um, but throughout all these audition processes, um, I figured out it's like getting nervous is like a really strong weapon. You know, when you get nervous, you're able to focus like really amazing. So, so if you can like, use that, um, ner you know, turn the nervous energy into positive focus, you can do amazing things, you know? So, um, yeah, so, so Rochester was just pure, uh, nervous energy focus. 
<laughs> and and that's that's actually where I met my husband. Um, that you know, that audition was the first time we ever met. He was on the committee, um, and uh, a year later I got into Milwaukee, and uh, you know, and that's that. And and I've been here since you know 2002. And yeah, my husband actually he uh, quit Rochester after a few years of uh, dating, and he's like. I think I'd rather get married to you, so I'm gonna quit. You know, so so then he came to Milwaukee, and then he freelanced for a few years, and then there was an audition for Horn, and he got in. It's like, are you kidding me? So yeah, that's the dream. <laughs> it is the dream. Yes, I'm like, okay, we're not gonna mess with this again. We were in the same orchestra twice. It's not gonna happen again. <laughs> thing we usually like to ask people um, is just if they have any advice yeah. for the musicians who will be watching. Mm, okay, so, um, okay, I have a, maybe a few, few advice. Um, so, you know, as we talked a lot today, you know, music comes straight from your heart. So, um, you know, usually I can tell who I want to hang out with and who I don't want to hang out with by listening to somebody play, you know? So, so it's like, you know, your heart is really important. So, so don't, don't just like polish your music, but polish your heart, you know? Um, and then help and serve people with the musical gift that you're given, you know? Don't, don't be like, just look at me, me, me. It's like, no, no, no. It's, it's about how can I serve people with my musical gift? So, you know, have that heart of serving people um, and, uh, you know, one thing that has been really helpful in my career is to always be kind and respectful of other people, you know, because you are going to be treated exactly the same way you treat other people. So, so be kind and respectful to everybody. Um, and, you know, keep enjoying the never ending journey of becoming the best version of you. You know, that, that never ends. And, you know, just have fun with that ride, you know? Um, and that's what makes being a musician so much fun, that it never ends. So I think those are the advice um, that I have for, you know, musicians. That's great. Thank you so much. This was yes. an amazing yes. um, interview and we love talking to you. It was so interesting and there's so many takeaways that we and our audience will get out of it.